My name is Linda Dumas, and I was very fortunate indeed to be part of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo while Mark Clapham was there. And I used to tease Talbot here and say, well, Talbot's been in the rodeo since he was three. Mm -hmm. But then I would qualify that and go, but Mark has been in the rodeo since he was two. So Mark was a senior member and I've been privileged to know him. And I think Talbot has some things he wants to say about him. Reading from the script, if you don't mind, I met Mark Clapham during my first year with the school art committee as a judge. Over the years, it had been rumored that Mark had been a judge on the committee since kindergarten. It was 1974 when he was lassoed into the group. During those early years, we both bore a similarity in appearance with some committee members calling me Mark and him Talbot. We looked like the Bobsey twins. To avoid any confusion during the taking of group photos, I had Mark stand at one end of the line while I stood at the other end. Any further confusion as to who changed uh, when Mark grew more facial hair and I became follically challenged. As an individual, Mark had few peers, being the consummate artist. Besides studying art as a pupil, he also taught art, practiced art, and judged art. Rounding out his career, he played football in Midland, Texas, and later at the University of Houston. Not one to show off his knowledge, Mark was one who provided personal insight while working with fellow school art judges. Never one to condescend, he often was consulted to put in his two cents worth, which was often needed and respected. Mark was a good all around sort of guy, the kind you'd like to have a few beers with after an art show. In the years following his passing, it was often mentioned at our shows, I wonder what Mark would have said about this piece of work. To those who knew and worked with him, with his spirit, in memory uh, persist. One of the things that I <clears throat> liked so much that I learned from Mark or felt that he emphasized <clears throat> was the quality of narrative. He frequently sought out the narrative in a piece and that's something I've applied ever since I learned that from him and I think that he gave as much attention to a piece on manila paper with a pre-kindergarten child to a finished piece by a senior with all the equipment and knowledge of 12 years of schooling. Then when we were asked to come and talk about Mark, I had called Jim Barron, who was another individual who had known him for a long time, and he told me the most fortunate thing ever. He told me about Joe, who has known Mark for years and was involved in much of his work. I'm Mike Carpino. I own Art Foundry Carpino. I've known or knew Mark mm -hmm. for at least 30 years. And uh, we had a different kind of relationship than these folks here. My relationship with Mark was based on the way we men talked to each other. And so a lot of times we were rude and crude to each other, <laughs> but it kind of works out. It's, uh, it was like working with one of the finest artists that you could ever work with. But he was also kind of controlling. He wanted to make sure that his interpretation was going to be the only interpretation. And the good thing about he and I is that's my philosophy too. I figure the artist is bringing me something. My obligation is to do the very best for that person. So through the years, Mark and I had a relationship. We could have arguments that didn't matter. Uh, he felt that I was a very, very good founderman. And I felt he was an extraordinarily good artist, and we complimented one another. And as the years went by, I've told the story now since Mark's been gone, because it's a story that I gotta believe, and I really truly believe this. I've told it about six times, and I might have a few more times in me, but I'm gonna do this now for the record. Before any of us knew that Mark was sick, uh, he'd give me a call, and sometimes it'd be like 8, 8.30 at night, so I answered the phone one night and we started talking. I think we had a little argument and then we started talking. He said, well, what are you doing tonight? I said, I'm, I said, it sounds crazy, but I'm watching Lo Lonesome Dove again. And he says, yeah, me too. And he says, which one? Because you never can tell you know, what you know, series you're watching. I said, what well, was the one where they take the trip back to Texas? 
And so Mark said something that was kind of strange. He says, uh, he says, hey man, he said, would you do that? And I says, uh, and I knew what he was talking about. And I said, you know, I, I said, I hate to say it. I said, I think I was a little bit smarter. I said, but yeah, I'd do it. I said, I, I got no choice. If it's a friend, I said, I'd have to do it. So anyway, nothing ever became of it. And then when we found out Mark was really bad off, and after he passed away, I was supposed to go to his funeral. Couldn't make his funeral because it was the first and only time, hopefully, that my shop had a big accident. And I had two guys down at the hospital while Mark was being utilized. And I couldn't make it, but in the end, what happened, I wound up getting a, an envelope, and I opened it up, and I found out that it was a last will and testament. And I uh, started to read it, and I found that he had left to me all of his waxes. So I didn't know what to think. First I was, wow, this is fantastic. And then I felt, wow, what am I going to do? What do you do? Should I, am I going to cast them? Is there going to be any uh, legal rights? Is there going to be any disputes? And I said, the heck with it. So I started casting them. So right now I have a pretty good size collection of works that have never ever been seen by anybody. There were no molds made of them, so there was no bronze. So little by little, we've been working our way through them. And I even put an addition onto my building because I'd like to put all his work in one area and then invite people over to see it. And I'd like to be able to sell it because Mark's goal is not to have his work stagnant, but to be out there where people can enjoy it. So, Mark really did, in a way, give me a challenge, and I only hope that uh, I, can, uh, I can do right by that. One thing that I learned from Mark and I was so impressed by was the fact that if it was anatomy, he knew about it. You'd go by and you'd be judging 3D art, and, and there would be a, a guy sitting in a chair, an Indian, and Mark would point out to you that his thighs were this long and if he fit his thighs, he'd be this high instead of this high. But he knew human anatomy, he knew horse anatomy, sheep, goats, <coughs> chickens, all sorts of anatomy. But there was one little joke that he had about a certain thing and I'm gonna let Talbot talk about that. Several years ago, we were judging, I forgot what district, but this kind of was all encompassing with other districts. When you look at kindergarten artwork and first grade artwork, it has a very sense of primitiveness about it because humans are depicted as stick figures and the animals are usually just depicted as like circles or squares with little legs. Well, we were at one kindergarten show and these were depicted as cattle. Well, Mark took one look and started to smile and he says, those really don't look like cattle. Those look like Cootie cattle, and the name stuck, and that's I call that a markism. But every now and then, when we go to a show, there's the cootie cattle. But you know, his, his spirit memory will always be with us. I think the first time that he said anything about being sick, we were at C.E. King, and we had to park in the back so we could go into the cafeteria, and most of their show, which has improved hugely since then, was laid out flat on tables mm -hmm. for everything except maybe the high school kids. And as we were coming out, he said that when we finished with the judging, he was gonna go in and have whatever was bothering him seen about. So then I found out what he had and that it was really serious. So I was able to speak on the phone with him for quite a while. He was, he was reticent, but at the same time, he was very outgoing, you know, and when you talked to him, he would tell you things, and it was just a privilege, a real privilege to know this man, to see the work that this man produced, and I'm just beyond thrilled that he is going to have a permanent home for his legacy. I think it's just fantastic. I'll answer the phone, and he would say to me, what are you doing, you guinea so-and-so? What are you doing, Wap? Okay. What are you doing? So, I mean, we were ethnic. Uh, 
I think guys like me and him, in a lot of ways, we enjoy teasing each other about ethnicity. So if I could think of the worst thing you could ever call an Indian, I would have given it to him. Right. So it was just, uh, what was the movie? It was just, Clint Eastwood had a movie, The uh, Grand Torino. You got to watch that movie. And what you'll find out is the way men usually treat each yeah, other. Yeah, with a car. And it's, uh, you know, we can be rather nasty, but it's in a really fun and spirited way. So I'll be m missing my red man for sure. Uh, that's the one thing I'll always think of is he and I teasing each other. Un unbelievably, to, to, if anyone ever heard us, it would have to be an embarrassment. And most of the time, Mark and I would have our arguments and what the arguments would always be about, I believe his work was worth far more than what he was selling for. And what I found out over the years is it's not just Mark, it's me, it's all of us. As we get older, I think our memories are locked into pricings from when we're younger. So if you remember the Cadillac being $8,000, and now you see a Cadillac is seventy-five, it still goes against your sensibility. So I used to say, Mark, you take such extraordinary time and pain doing this stuff, and you're meticulous. You have to get pricing for that. It doesn't make any sense. And so his argument to me was he had been doing it a lot longer than me that I didn't understand. So our arguments were always based on what I have to argue with myself, that sometimes you have to remember your work is worth money, and you really have to. So our arguments were based on things like that, and it was always a good spirited thing. And right now, my biggest thing, I wish I could have him here to ask him a bunch of questions. By leaving me those waxes, he's got me into a position where I have to try to outthink myself what would mark, what's his intentions? And there's just so many things now that I'm seeing in his work, I'd just like to simply say, hey, is this what you had wanted? Is this the way you were interpreting it? So now I'm really missing not being able to simply ask him what his thoughts were. I was surprised when I found uh, that Mark had been a football player because I only knew one other person that had been successful in football who was also a really good artist and it worked around to where we had something in common. I was a graduate of Auburn University. Well, in 1969 I believe it was, Auburn got to go to the Blue Bonnet Bowl and the opponent was University of Houston. So when I mentioned this to Mark he got this little smile on his face and he said, sorry but he wasn't. Talking about football, you know, uh, anybody that knows Mark, when you called him, he couldn't turn his head like this, his whole body had to turn. Yeah, I remember. Right. And, you know, yeah, you think, or whatever. Well, you can say whatever you want, but you take right. kind of hits, and some of them guys were a lot bigger than Mark, right. you know, back in the day. They were just starting to get six foot three, six foot fives, and, you know, weighing almost 300 pounds. So, I used to, I was sometimes a real bastard, but I, I'd call him just so that I have to see him move like mm -hmm. that. You know, but uh, yeah, football, University of Houston was his, I would say Conroe, then the university, right in there between those two things that he loved the most. But he really did think a lot of the University of Houston. So anytime they call me for a Cougar, I feel really good because it kind of gets his work back out there. Mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, university is very important to him. I tried to find out more about the football thing, so I, I Googled and Googled and Googled, and all of a sudden found uh, where people had written on the funeral homepage after he died. I found out that he was a fullback, and that Larry Gatlin was halfback. Was it, well, uh, maybe he was a quarterback. Let me check my facts here. Mm -hmm. Well, the sheet said he, he was a linebacker, but he, I mean, you, you, he you played play fullback, yeah. Back there, and Larry right. Gatlin played quarterback for the Odessa Broncos. Mm -hmm. Then they played football at the University of Houston when Wade Phillips was also playing for the Cougars. And this was a man I don't know. His name was James Ulrich. And he talked about knowing Mark II when he had a studio on Road Street. But anyway, he said when Mark passed away, the University of Houston 
the state of Texas and the city of Conroe lost a gifted talent and I lost a good friend. For anyone thinking that uh, they have what it takes to be an artist, I think Mark Clapham would say something like, uh, be true to yourself. Uh, don't let anybody tell you what to do. You do what you feel like you should do. And uh, in his case, he would want that person to be meticulous. It doesn't matter what kind of art, you must be meticulous. Here's the one question I'd love to ask him. I'd like to know if it was true or not, because people say we say things to each other and we just, you know, we don't really listen until it's too late. But one time I said to him, I said, you know, I consider you to be a great painter. But look at your sculpture. I mean, your sculpture tells stories just like your paintings. Uh, you know, it, what motivated you to do that? And he said one time, he says, well, he said, whenever I'm painting something, he says, it always bothered me, I don't know what's on the other side. He said, so, he said, I'd grab some wax and I'd start working on it so I can see it from a different perspective. So now the question would be to Mark, was that true or is that just some cool thing that you tell people? But that's one of the things I'd love to know. Why did he do it? Did he do it just for pleasure or was it true that he wanted to uh, see the other side? He told me once mm -hmm. that he was making a sculpture because he wanted to do a painting. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, whoa, mm -hmm. talk about. I know, but Mark it was a very creative man, mm -hmm. even in his mind. Mm -hmm. And that may have been a great way of telling somebody, hey, look, you know, this. It's better than saying, no, I just want to try sculpture. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> His sculptures are for to be clay or bronze or whatever. The thing that impresses me so much about those sculptures is that they are fluid. They're metal, but they there's a fluidity there. And I just don't even understand how you do it, but it, it's there. Well, he likes secrets. That's why I think that... Uh, you know, when he tells you things, you have to always think, well, did he have another meaning? I was just showing the folks there's a series of painted horses over there, and nobody seems to realize it, but Mark has faces in the painted uh, shapes on the horses. And uh, one of them you can really see, it's Lincoln, but I'm pretty sure George Washington, there's a bunch of them on there. We even found on this one piece called the Gate Crasher, we have a small tabletop one that I'm going to send one to the president because I just think the name, I think Mark, knowing Mark was a conservative, uh, I do believe he would have loved Donald Trump. I'm just telling you the different things we talked about were pretty much, you know, the way we felt about politics. And the gate crashers, he did a big piece, one that would fit on the top of this table. And it was done in wax and we had to convert it into a mold just to make sure that if anything happened to me, that there were molds made of it, because the wax can be destroyed and damaged, but once the mold, you have something that another foundry could have reproduced if something happened to me. So we get this thing all together, and didn't realize it, but on the base of this big piece, he's got, and, and because it's called the gate crashers, it's a big storm that these steer are in and the steer are running and they're crashing through a gate and one of them is upside down and you're thinking, is that, did he break his neck? And on the base of it, on the big one, he's got a symbol of a man that looks like a Nordic type with the north wind. And he's going, Phew. none of us ever saw it. None of us were ever aware of it. So we made a mold and we didn't even know it until we had cast the piece. And I said, he did it again. He stuck something in there mm -hmm. that I'd like to ask him. Was that an afterthought? Did you? Is that the reason why you did it? Why did you do it? So there's these little questions I'd love to ask him. Every once in a while, Talbot and Mark would do some man thing, and I would tell them, you guys are the bad boys of the rodeo, and they loved it. Mm -hmm. Mark really loved it when I told him he was a bad boy. We had our limits with the ladies of the you know, we had a certain level. And just have been just you and me and Mark have been. We well, saw that one picture of it, didn't we? The one that's on the bottom, I think. It's Mark and a couple of his uh, lady, uh, yeah. you know, that's a bad boy there. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, he, he, 
The one thing I can say about him, he was all man, but he had a sensitive side, because look around us. I was multifaceted, you know? I'll agree with you. You know, I mean, to be able to, some of these things that he selected to collect on his own, he's got one heck of a collection just because. So. I just wanted to be observant, you know, see all what's around, like giving advice. I always tell the little children, I say, just, the world's a beautiful place. Art's all around you. How did you go from a table size? bronze to the small ones, because I know Baron was telling me that he had that piece. We were talking about the fluidity. Well, Mark is one of those guys, he's been sculpted. See, if you get a normal artist and they create a tabletop and they decide they're going to make something bigger, a lot of times they'll actually have a foundry where somebody else do what they call pointing it up. And, uh, but that wasn't Mark. And that's the genius behind him. First of all, he was working in wax. Nobody works in wax. Everybody works in clay. Wax is hard to work with, but it has a soul to it that when you do it the way he does, oh my God, the things that he can do with his heating tools and everything. Well, anyway, uh, what he did was, the gate crash is a per perfect example. The one is only about 12 inches, and the big one is pretty much an exact copy of that that he had to re-sculpt. So he re-sculpted it. That's not what artists normally do. They'll usually, you know, they're going to make their attention on the first piece, and then anything else they'll have somebody else kind of sort of do. It. Not everybody, but so yeah. Mark was the guy that, uh, if someone said that they wanted the gate crashers done as a life size, there's where me and him would have had an argument. I would have been saying, Mark, you got to get some help here, you know, because. One man trying to, right. you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I have a funny feeling he would have. I think he would have tackled it himself. So, yeah, you don't. Mark Mark won't let nobody do his work. Yeah, that's that's the truth. So on the um, on the two D works, did y'all talk about that much? Because I was struck when I came in here about how vivid all the colors were in the portrait of the Native Americans and things like that, and it. I think I see more love for those paintings than some of the others that are around, but the, the sheer vibration of colors and how vivid it is, is something I really love. Did y'all talk about so. that? Well, I think what it is, is, you know, it's like anything else, he had his favorites. So, you know, he didn't know if something's going to be his favorite when he started it out. But I'll tell you, like the, uh, uh, I don't know if that's the corn woman back there. Or the Comanche dancer or something All I know is that there is fantastic. Oh, and he and I were supposed to, we were going to do a trade for the Indian chief up there. I was going to cast him a piece, a big piece, and we were supposed to trade out. And then, of course, Mark got sick and we never did. But uh, I do have a copy of that flag piece up there. And that's over my fireplace. Matter of fact, I have a funny feeling that's kind of why Mark also felt comfortable. See, I got I collect a lot of art. I've got David Attucks. I've got, I probably got one of the bigger collections of his stuff. But in my house, over the fireplace, sat Mark Clapham's mm -hmm. flag piece. So when Mark was over my house, he knew because he I didn't know he was going to come over to my place. He didn't know when he came over. He saw his piece in the most honored spot, and he realized he even drew in the four corners there. You see. He's got the two of them on the bottom done in color and two in the bottom up on top done in, in pencil. He did four of them for me on my flag piece. So I think he realized that, you know, I really did care about his work and it probably made his decision easier for him to leave that to me. So. Well, did he ever work with other foundries or were you? Uh... The only other foundry that I know of was Al Shakus. That was the one picture in there. I don't know. I brought these photos up. I thought they would, whoever was trying to get the photo from Kruger, you know, might appreciate some of these because nobody's ever seen any of these. Talbot and I came up to Mark Services, and on the casket was an Indian blanket. No flowers, no plants, but it was just covered with this beautiful Indian blanket. And we just thought it was so fitting. All I can say is, is he was proud of his heritage. Mm -hmm. Both, by the way. I mean, he didn't shun that he had, you know, right. Caucasian, I mean, white men too. But uh, he was a proud man. He also told me about his mother. Mm -hmm. 
she was a renowned painter of porcelain. Her books are still being sold on eBay. Are they? Yeah, I, I've gone a couple of times just to, to see, but uh, now, no, what she was, was, she what was, was her name? Uh, Wanda. 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 And she uh, wasn't just here, she was world renowned. Was she full blooded or? Oh, yeah, she yeah. was the real deal. Yeah. The father was. More got that spirit out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, the yeah. truth is, is that you had that kind of culture. I hate yeah. to say it, but Irish, Scottish, it's yeah. kind of boring. You know, you got that Indian blood in your boy. Yeah. You know, it's got to be something special. And that made him truly an American more than me. Mm -hmm. Now, my people have been here since, what, 1900? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if I had something in special, I'd want to enhance that. This is why it's good to have dialogue, different mm -hmm. perspective and dialogue and things like that. I wish Baron could have come because he knew Mark for a long time and he told me that he had a copy of The Gate Crashers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, so, I yes. yeah, and that was uh, also on one of the web things because I looked up to see what he had on the web mm -hmm. and that was one of the things on there and some of a uh, couple of the Native American portraits and the span over the highway here, mm -hmm. you know, and I was showing it to my Ooh, husband and I said, this is the guy that we're going to talk about. And he's like, whoa.